we go. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Pedophile Huntress. We're here this evening with a common goal, that you be encouraged in heart and united in love. We hope that we can intervene in areas of your life that you've been struggling with. We want you to know that we've been there, that we've lived through it, and that we understand. We welcome you tonight. Tonight, we're going to focus on talking about uh, the parts that are intricately woven in our lives coming through childhood sexual crimes. It kind of hides in different crevices, and we're going to talk about that, how our thoughts and beliefs are changed. We also want to talk to you guys about, is it okay to take breaks from counseling, from EMDR and other such uh, healing modalities? I think that's a really good topic to talk about. And then I really want to talk about how you pray or if you pray and how you cry out to God or if you cry out to him. And to me, there's real good reasons to talk about this because our family wearies of listening to us, our friends weary of listening to us. But I'll tell you what, coming through these crimes that last for years and years and years, you need someone to talk about. So I, I thought that we could talk about what that looks like in our lives. So I want to welcome Emily and Carol back with me. Anybody who's listened to the podcast um, for time, which actually it just turned over the 10,000 mark on all uh, different on Apple and on oh, Spotify. Yeah, really cool, actually. Even in you guys, uh, YouTube, I hit the 10,000 mark. It's, it's going over that. And I just, again, Wonderful. think it's interesting for the listener that, you know, I have 135 followers. Isn't that wild? And on Spotify, I only have 72, but Apple podcast actually is the highest 72% of my podcast listeners. So I, again, I just welcome you guys. I know that this is a tough thing. People don't even like to participate through um, subscriptions or whatever. I get it. Um, you know, I'm out here doing this because we love you guys. We care. Ultimate mm -hmm. healing is always giving back and taking our eyes off of our own pain because it helps us grow, right, as human beings. So um, anyway, welcome, ladies. I love having you guys here with us. It's just fantastic. We've really decided that we're going to do these discussion podcasts once a month. Um, then I will have other people on at other times. But I love being with these ladies, and it's just a great uh, discussion platform. So let's go ahead and talk about, let's just move into you guys I want, and I know you guys know this because all of us were abused for multiple years in our childhood. When that happens, our belief systems are changed. Mm -hmm. Our thoughts are changed. You know, like for me, I don't trust people. I have a hard time trusting people. You do one thing and instantly my heart's like, I don't trust you. I'm going to go. You know what I mean? And I try super hard. You guys, I love people. I'm compassionate, but you know what? I like spending a lot of time alone because it's safe. Do you guys, so, you know, that's one thing for me, but you guys talk about those, these effects that I've been in counseling for 20 years. They're still with me. And, and while I'm much, much better, I mean, I used to drink two, three bottles of wine a night just to get through the terror of just all the, the sexual abuse and the murder and all of these things. But um, I certainly don't do that anymore. So while we grow, Talk to me about some of the things that are left in your life. Carol, you can go ahead and start tonight with what is that spark in you when I bring that up? Um, oh, it sparks a whole lot with me. Um, and and I think the primary thing is like you're saying is not feeling safe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like like you're saying, oh, I've been doing this for a lot of years, for about 30 years trying to recover and um it's very difficult to regain that trust of other people and a sense of safety um and i'm extremely protective of children mm -hmm. <laughs> as you might imagine exactly it, i just cringe so many times when i hear they're put in a new program or they're with with caregivers that we don't really know my like my grandkids mm -hmm. um letting them walk in front of the house is our latest mm -hmm. issue. And I, it terrifies me, you know, mm -hmm. so it, yeah. And you want to get over it and it's very hard to know where the line of healthiness is, you know, where <laughs> you is know, it? I laugh because yes, I you agree. Know, are you right? making your kids crazy mm -hmm. or, you know, what is, what is the line? And um, yeah, so 
that well, certainly right. hides in Ex my brain. Exactly. Because one of the things is when people don't come from this, I work with counselors in the CASA program and either they're in denial or they have no experience with trauma. You know yeah. what I mean? Cause mm -hmm. I listen to them and I'm thinking you are really making light of this stuff. And I, and I wonder you guys, if it's experience too, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. because we saw the darkness that life can bring mm -hmm. and some people just don't have that experience. And so then they minimize, right? They minimize, yeah. minimize, minimize. And we're like, why the yeah. heck are you minimizing? Yes. Emily, go and ahead and, 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 oh, I'm sorry, Carol, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I think when people haven't experienced this, they have no idea right. what lurks and, and, and particularly by, you know, people that seem very normal, sexual abuse does That's that, so you know, these mm -hmm. do not, these people don't necessarily look, you know, really creepers scary. are around the corner, right? <laughs> like they're and not so creepers I around the corner. Of, I don't fully trust anybody unless I know them a long time and, mm -hmm. and see what they do. So I don't know how you feel about that, Emily. Well, you know, I was actually just talking with my husband, husband about this. Cause Jody, I listened to a couple of your snippets on the podcast feed. I was trying to get my head into this space to prepare mm -hmm. for tonight. And you had the clip about what love really is versus how you internalize what quote unquote love is in an abusive relationship and something that I had to learn was that I didn't have to make restitution for a mistake I made I didn't have to be punished for mm. doing something wrong so uh, an example the first night my husband and I were at our new apartment after getting married. I went out in our one car that was a gift from my husband's grandfather to him. I went out to pick up dinner. We had driven all day to get to our destination. And when I was parking in the parking garage under the apartment, I didn't give enough clearance and I completely scraped the whole side of my husband's oh, car. No. So... I instantly expected him to be angry. I expected to be belittled, to be yelled at, you know, all those things, which I had experienced mm -hmm. always in my life. Um, and he just hugged me and he said, are you okay? It's okay. It's a car. And I, that will mm -hmm. forever stick in my mind. And that was Beautiful. almost 20, oh, almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of how my expectation when I make a mistake, I have a hard time because I'm full of fear if I make a mistake. Right. You, you know what's funny though, what I really hear underneath that is a complicity, some kind how we're complicit in mm -hmm. these acts with them. And you guys, you know what? We are not complicit in these crimes. Mm -hmm. We are 100% victims but we don't ever get treated like we're victims. No, we don't treat ourselves like we're victims. We treat ourselves like somehow we allowed this or wanted. I, I mean, I don't even right. And that is a message that yes. that I have internalized before and had to work through. Yes. So yes, that and then if there's a problem, others, we're the problem. Right. Yeah, we're always yeah. the, the right. cause of it. Exactly. And that's definitely something that I've had to retrain my brain in right mm -hmm. and like recognize when that pattern's coming through and not take on everybody else's problems as my problems and all of that because I've always wanted to get like what I ended up doing in my family was trying to get through with the least waves possible like to yeah, fix yeah. everything so be I wouldn't girl. Yeah. yeah exactly be a good so girl. regardless of how I felt underneath right but I that's what I was trying to self preserve for good reason but another one is that for a long time I couldn't take up space so like let's say I'm in the kitchen somebody else walks into the kitchen I will automatically get out of their way and move because mm. I defer I defer I defer boy so, I, I resonate with that too yeah I do so too. like mm -hmm. I grew up in such a domineering space where you're always on eggshells because you never want to offend or set anybody off 
Right. And um, well, I stay think invisible, right? Right. Yeah. Just like keep it on the down low because mm-hmm. you don't want to get anybody upset. Right. Um, and so that was something that I've, and I still work on it, you know, like if mm-hmm. I'm coming down a stairwell and somebody else is coming, I will. I will always dodge and get out of the way, but it's like, no, it's okay that you're coming down a stairwell. Like it's okay. So, you know, like Mm -hmm. growing into my own, being my own self and taking up space. Um, That's something I I think think that's huge though. I do because thinking about that again, um, when you're a child and nobody validates what happens to you and nobody helps you, the message really is stay hidden and don't bother my world you're just a bother. Mm -hmm. And when you're Mm -hmm. just a bother and you come to the world as an adult, that those messages don't change easily. Right. I mean, Mm -hmm. they really don't change easily. Um, yeah, Carol, I don't know. That's it's, it just makes me think so much. And the weird thing is I was going to read this passage in this book, my book, a prisoner by no crime of my own. Um, it's, it's just really funny that you say that I just happened to be looking at it today And this was after the murder and we had returned home and my mom was waiting for us. And I write, my little world had been invaded by an act of destruction that I could never unsee. I felt a a desperate need for someone to even look at me for any kind of attention. If someone could have just held me, if even for a few seconds, those hours and the next hours of torture could have been eased. Truly, I would have settled for someone just talking to me. I was used to not receiving care, but I did need someone to help me. Maybe ask me what I needed. You know what, you guys, this, mm-hmm. this is a theme though, whatever it is that, that that's for the rapes that happened. It's all of it, mm-hmm. but it's what we're talking about. We're not really seen. So like when we're in the way, we're in the way, we're always in the way, right? Yeah. We're not seen. We, yeah. We don't have enough value to take up space. Exactly. You know, we're, we're something to be, you know, swept under the carpet and um oh and God, and of so course true. all our feelings like you're saying jody all our feelings were of no importance <laughs> nobody gave a damn about what we were feeling right? I, at least uh, i felt like that no you know? i mm-hmm. i absolutely felt and i know emily yeah. did too because when you go and you ask for help and nobody helps you there's no other this mm-hmm. isn't actually a hard thing that's one plus one equals two you know what i mean that's yeah. not even confusing mm-hmm. it's pretty simple you be quiet go like you said just go under the rug <laughs> You, Because one of the things that we talk about often is really child abuse is actually adults don't like it because it wrecks their world. You guys, they can't be narcissistic mm-hmm. and just have their pleasures, live their little Edens. They don't want to be disturbed by it. Oh, don't tell That's me exact, that because then yeah. I have to do something. You know what I mean? Yeah, because then my facade and my house of cards yes. is completely yes, disrupted know. and I am not ready for that. Yeah. Right. I like, like that, that your house of cards. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and I'll say with the kitchen, I felt like I had a lot of trauma with it. My mother, you know, would blow up and I would just tiptoe, you know, around the mm-hmm. kitchen. And if I didn't do it right, I was in trouble. If I came mm-hmm. in, I was in trouble. If I did something, you know, it, it didn't matter what it was. So there's already a lot of trauma around just being in a silly kitchen, you know? Yeah. Um, is it, It's every day. And it, it's, it's, every, it's every day. day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It's yeah. funny, then, Carol, when you say, when you say that, I, I think of my mom and I don't know why this has come back to me many times in my life and I'm not sure why, but our kitchen, there was a stairwell that came into the kitchen, a stairway. Mm-hmm. And I hid there and my mom was making rice pudding and it would take like two hours and she was reading a book And it stuck in my mind just watching her because I couldn't have gone to her and talked to her. I would have been a bother, but I don't know why it's so weird. I just, I just, it's kind of etched in my mind, just watching her there that night, probably Mm -hmm. wanting her, probably wanting to know who Mm -hmm. she was. And I bet I was probably seven or eight, but she just wasn't part of my world. She really wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so it's weird when you say that there was something about that was their dominion. And my mom was kind of a rageaholic too. And you just didn't go in there. Like I just didn't, didn't go in there, yeah. but I, I was watching the scene. I don't know why that stuck in my mind. Isn't that mm-hmm. interesting? But yeah. it is. And like well, you say, yeah. You feel like you're outside. Yes. That's how it felt to me. Yes. I was out. Even in our own I was homes. out. Yes, absolutely. And that links to a sense of home, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Or not. 
right? Um, which is huge. Oh, but, that's, you know, that's, yeah. wow, that, and then again, where do you ever feel comfortable in life when you mm -hmm. never had the peace of feeling comfort in your own bed, in your yeah. own home, then right. how, you know, it's funny because people talk about peace a lot. And I know my counselor used to tell me, Jody, if I can get you off red alert to Amber, I've done my job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I live with that. And the older I get, I'm learning to be more peaceful. It helps to live in the country and not the city. But, you know, in the city, you can probably find peace as well. Just for me, that worked. I healed a lot being mm -hmm. out in nature. But yeah, the, it's interesting. So one of the other things, you guys, that I thought about, that which that's profound, you guys, to talk about not having peace in your own home as a child or not feeling yeah. welcome and mm -hmm. only being there as a piece of trash that could be disposed. But the other thing that has been hard for me is I grapple with, because when I went to my family and talked about this, at first, a few people came out and then all of a sudden, everybody was lying. Then my dad lied. And then my dad said, Satan planted in my head to destroy him. Then my mom lied. And so mm. do you guys have a problem when people talk? I'm always wondering if they're lying or not. <laughs> is that <laughs> something that you guys grapple with yeah. or no? No, I definitely... Uh, and of course, I'm talking, you know, the closer you are with the family, I mean, the more you're you're questioning everything right. you know, that's being said. Yeah. And and trying to figure out, are they understanding at all or are they part of the problem? You know, right. Right. Yeah. I think that that's always there. Trusting relationships is very hard. Yes, and, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Emily, what do you think about so, that? So Jody, do you mean generally or do you mean people within the family? No, I mean generally, because it, it even extends outside of my family. People will tell things and I want to know if they're exaggerating, if they're telling the truth, mm -hmm. because I gauge trustworthiness on truth telling, <laughs> because I've mm -hmm. noticed the older, I mean, as I've aged to me, if you can't stand in your truth in life, I don't have a whole lot of time for you anymore because mm -hmm. you live in fantasies, you live in denials, mm -hmm. you live yeah. in, I'm going to change my story or sanitize my story. Mm -hmm. I like hanging out with people that don't sanitize their story and they're comfortable with it anyway. Well, so and I, you know how destructive that is. So it it, exactly. Ex it's so destructive. You guys, I would have never mm -hmm. been the person I am today, which I just got an, another wonderful, wonderful kind of promotion raise at work. So I, I believe oh, in good. this is right. And so, I mean, and the reason I say that is all of this hard work to heal and do all these things, mm -hmm. it is recognized in life, but I love talking about these things that are ever present with us. Right. And mm -hmm. so I can tell when people exaggerate or, you know, and sometimes maybe they don't, but I'm looking anyway, <laughs> you know, well, it's just that's that thing that's left. And there is a high cost to hang out with people mm -hmm. who minimize, right. And dismiss important oh, yeah. things. And, you know, I think I have a really good radar, mm -hmm. but I think because of my grandparents' influence, which you might remember from my story. Go ahead and say I had some, um, I had some really good experiences mm -hmm. with them and they were very trustworthy and they That's cared cool. for me well. And so I'm grateful for that, but I definitely have a pretty good BS meter, like you right. know, if the CEO, and maybe that's of, a good way to say it. Go ahead. <laughs> but if I were, I started a job a couple years ago, and as soon as the CEO sat down for the orientation, I was like, I didn't trust him, and he was, you know, supposed to be someone trustworthy, of course. Mm -hmm. And I remember that very pointedly when you said that, Jody. I just was like, no, nope. mm -hmm. I. And then I ended up quitting that job right before they fired all the dietitians. So, oh, wow. So, you know, you like, good, I think that's good. You have a good, a good intuition. Yes. And so that's one of the benefits of going through it's, something yeah. as terrible as we have is mm -hmm. you have experience with reading people as unfortunate that, as it yeah, was, be, right. you know, and I think that's very true. We have, we started reading. I always say that I've been listening and watching since I was four. <laughs> and I have, because you guys yeah. think about that. We're on hypervigilance. They call it now, you know, yeah, whatever you call say, it. Yeah. Hypervigilance. Yeah. yeah. And we yeah. know we have we, to be, we have to be the only way you survived. Mm -hmm. It is the uh, only way growing up is really mm -hmm. watching and, 
And I also feel, excuse me, Jody. I think. No, I, no, you're fine. Go. But, um, you know, I think that, um, yeah, I, I just had to be that way. And thank God I was. And probably thank God I'm, you know, hyper vigilant with children now. Mm -hmm. You know, when I see what, how people, you know, how they'll let somebody babysit that they don't even know. And um, I don't know. I, I just could never do that. I just, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and I can, I, I'll tell this story just a little bit, but in my own family, this situation happened where a grandparent said, can I take this grandson just on a road trip? And we all went, don't let it happen. And guess yeah. what? Yeah. That, that child came back and had mm. many stories to tell looking for ticks. And then of course the stories grow and Oh, no. you know what, I always err on the side of saying, no, you know what? I'm uncomfortable with yeah. that. But we, mm -hmm. for some reason, pedophiles make us just give, you know, go against your instinct and say, oh, go yeah. ahead. These are mm -hmm. babies. These are babies. And it's, it's our mm -hmm. job. We're entrusted to keep them safe. So Carol, I don't think I tell everybody that I know if I offend you, then don't stand by me, but I'm going to err on the side of saying I have a problem with that. <laughs> Yeah. Only when it comes to a child might not be safe. I don't get easily offended by all this political BS and all that. I just, mm -hmm. I don't. I mean, that kind of stuff doesn't offend me. But when I do see something in a child or in a relationship and I don't feel like it's right, I speak up. Mm -hmm. I absolutely speak up absolutely. In, in my family. And I've definitely upset some people about it oh, by yes. speaking up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, because... It's pedophiles can be the kindest yep. sweetest people and they're grooming the child and the parent mm -hmm. you know the parents are like oh yeah we really like under uncle bill you know he's such a nice guy brings gifts yep. what whatever yeah. um and people fall for it you know mm -hmm. Well, I yeah. don't know if you guys listened to that, Michael Jackson, the, those two men that did that uh, mm -hmm. interview. That was fascinating. And he actually groomed the parents tremendously. Yeah. He would call and say, oh, I need help. I need comfort. He'd go to their house. Like the grooming was just classic grooming. Huge. And they bought, he bought houses for them. And then these parents honestly let their children stay in situations that were so miserably unsafe. Mm -hmm. kind of for their own benefit too. I mean, I hate to say that, but when you listen to these, yeah. these mm -hmm. poor children that live through it, mm -hmm. it, it's the same thing that people do. I don't want to be bothered by it. Like I posted mm -hmm. this uh, saying that said um, something about it's, if you don't listen to a child when they're little, maybe that's, you know, you can get by with that, but you will cut when they're adults and they come back to you, you're going to pay for that. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people like that because it's true when those adults mm -hmm. come back and say, dude, you didn't listen to me. Right. I right. needed you. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. So staying on track here, one of the other things mm -hmm. that I really did was I turned to addiction. Even as a child, um, mm -hmm. I had great confusion. Like as a child, I can't say I know now that it was pain, but I was so confused and just trying to survive guzzling on daily doses of just damage that you know, you don't define it as pain, but I remember as a child eating to the point of, I'd go back to my bedroom and just throw up all over my bedroom floor. Mm. And, you know, mm. I ate my way into a pretty size 20 at that time. Then of course I needed to have boyfriends. So then I lost weight to get out of that. My dad gave me that awful book called help Lord. The devil wants me fat. And you had to fast for 10 days. I think Satan wrote that book, but that's another podcast. Gosh. It's a horrible book. So I'll, Anyway, then I lose all this weight, but now guess what? Now I turn to alcohol because yeah. I needed to something to fill that void. And, mm -hmm. and indeed it was a real void. I know people don't understand this, but, um, one time I heard this AA or lady say without alcohol, I would have died. And I know people mm -hmm. don't get that, but whatever makes us survive you guys. Yeah. I'm of the mindset now. I, we don't want you to just, I don't want to destroy myself. But during a few of my years, I was in such deep, deep pain going through the murder investigation. And then all of that time period was all these mm -hmm. rapes and all this stuff going on. Oh my God, I had to go to work. I had to go to bed and I couldn't. So I don't know. You guys talk about that. I, I feel um, I'm very cautious about this, but addictions also kind of save us a little bit. Does anybody yeah, know do. what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My therapist was saying, you know, you should, and I have, uh, have had problems with sugar addiction and, um, my therapist said, you should thank yourself for coming up with something 
to, to soothe yourself. Mm-hmm. You had, you know, when you have nothing soothing you and taking care of you, the emotional part of you, you've got to figure out something on your own, you know? And, and again, it's kind of a survival thing that just doesn't work mm-hmm. once you're an adult, but, but, well, you know, that see, and I think that that that's a beautiful way to say what I've always said. You know what I mean? Because when the kids would say, "Mom, you're drinking too much," I knew I was drinking too much. I knew one day I wouldn't drink too much. I had to get through that day. I got up and went to work. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, but I didn't have anybody else there with me. I, you know, for mm-hmm. years was single, and I was in counseling, and in counseling rips off a lot of wounds, right? Yeah. And I can remember sitting in that counseling office thinking, I'm going to have a few drinks when I'm done here. And then yeah. I gamble. You know what? I was still healing. I don't, I really don't think people mm-hmm. understand that healing's a, a process and it's messy, right? And so I like to be really authentically raw about what it looks like. It's not like, mm-hmm. oh, I got a cup of tea and I sat down and I journaled. It didn't look like that at all. Yeah. I would ball in the shower. I yeah. would drink too much and then take a bath and cry. But I also went back to counseling. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. I also did the work that he asked me to do. So it wasn't like I just checked out. Sometimes I check out for a while, but then I came back to the work. So Emily, what is that? What, what do you have to say about this? Yeah. Well, I think I like skated along a lot of different addictions. So for a while, I was overeating a whole lot to numb out when I was a kid. I remember it very distinctly Mm -hmm. because all the attention Mm -hmm. was going to my abuser. And I was just so sad and in the shadows. And I remember that feeling of eating to the point of just a lot of discomfort. And then I kind of switched the other way when I was in high school I was definitely teetering towards anorexia nervosa. And, mm-hmm. you know, as a dietitian, I know all the diagnostic criteria for mm-hmm. anorexia nervosa. I never hit those exactly. Um, and I can thank a dietitian actually for helping me, but I was near heading down that slope. Like I think I would have ended up in treatment if I had not mm-hmm. encountered that woman to help me. But Mm -hmm. I've always used physical activity as a coping mechanism Mm -hmm. to the point where I would say it would be classified in the past for me as addiction. But again, I would much rather be out running 10 miles than, you know, acting on (laughs) uh, acting on suicidal thoughts or, you know, other forms of self-harm or Mm -hmm. panic attacks or whatever you know right the alternative would have been at that time or being home honestly like being outdoors just got me out of the house and moving oh I've heard a lot of victims say that yep just I was it was a place for me to be that was not Mm -hmm. in right a toxic home right Um, And the other thing that's been consistent for me through my life, which is mixed, and I have to keep a rein on even now is academics and career, because I love Mm -hmm. to learn, and I can just get completely lost in my books. And it's a beautiful world to be lost in. And chemistry is amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And I just love memorizing every bit that I can get my head around, which has served me well, yeah, in my career. Mm -hmm. But to the detriment of social relationships at times I was in college and it was a Saturday night and I was studying chemistry I was like sitting at the table my house studying chemistry and a friend stopped by and he's like you are a 20 year old woman or I was 21 (laughs) by that time you're a 21 year old woman in college I'm going to take you out (laughs) and so (laughs) basically I was out of balance to the yeah, point where yeah, I yeah. was losing richness and health in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting that academics can become that for some people, but it was my sanctuary for sure. Oh, I think it's true. Yeah, you know, from forever. One of the things you know, that- I'm a chemist. You so, are? Yeah. Oh, well, that's I mean, cool. Yeah, I have several degrees and one of them is chemistry. And I worked in um, process chemical engineering for a long time in Silicon Valley. Oh, very cool. Yeah. It's beautiful. Stuff. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you know, and to hear all of us so accomplished, it's a beautiful thing too. And, and in my podcast the a week ago, 
I talked about the strength of survivors because it's really mm -hmm. true. Although mm -hmm. I like to talk about these things because I do feel like it's an intervention for a lot of people to hear that these are just common themes. And one of the common themes that we all just brought up was food in childhood. Do you know what mm -hmm. I think? What else do we have at our disposal, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, I suppose you could sneak booze or whatever. There was a lot of booze in my house. I didn't, but food is that. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, you know, our relationship with food, sadly, I was even talking to the Lord about it today kind of at work because we had this rep come in and she brought these beautiful pastries. I don't eat that kind of stuff. And I let myself have half of one. And mm. then, you know, I just braid myself. And I think this is so ridiculous that I can't have a normal relationship with food. Yeah, with food. I, You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's so mm -hmm. you guys. And so that to me is another residual effect of mm -hmm. my childhood. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think about that? I think eating disorders are very linked to sexual abuse. Um, and I've seen um, quite a bit written about that. I mean, it's certainly like you read uh, trauma experts, they'll, you know, always include that, uh, that when you've mm -hmm. had this severe trauma, and like you say, Jody, that as a child, you just don't have a lot of outlets for the emotion. Exactly. Um, yeah. And so I think it's a very common one. I think it's, you know, whether it's, compulsive overeating bulimia or, or anorexia it right. seems to go with the body shame the um you know the very skewed view of your mm -hmm. physicality uh there's many issues that uh tie together with that so right emily and here mm -hmm. you're a dietitian do you think that has something to do with trying to get you know uh your relationship with food in order yeah, definitely. And in fact, that encounter with that woman in college was so powerful to me, that dietitian in college, mm -hmm. that it changed my trajectory of my uh, career because I realized this is powerful. And mm -hmm. I, it was such a healing time for me and my work with her was so healing um, that, I mean, I think that my relationship with food has been ongoing through my life, but i personally have done so much work because in order to be an ethical practicing dietitian, right. you have to do your own work. Right. So, um, yeah, I've done a lot and I've been through a program called the body positive and became a licensed oh, yeah, I've facilitator heard that. for that program. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, you know, at this point I feel really, good about eating and food and myself but I don't know if that will be forever I can't there's no guarantee right but I've definitely had ups and downs struggles um and know that I always need to be aware of that for myself mm -hmm. exactly yeah it's really like true. you're saying Jody this healing is very much a roller coaster mm -hmm. ride. It just goes way up and way down. And mm -hmm. that's really normal. good weeks. Then <laughs> not good weeks. Yeah, not good weeks. Exactly. And yeah, very difficult mm -hmm. times. And it just seems to be how that's how it goes, you know. Mm -hmm. Although the really um ugly, horrible pain, I think, you know, goes away. Yes. And you get more of this kind of more numb, numbed out kind of feeling, I think. Um, well, you... which actually leads me right into the next thing that I want to talk about is, and then we're going to talk about that, Carol, is when is it okay to take breaks from counseling, EMDR, yeah. and all of the other healing modalities? I know some people actually, it's kind of like becoming a professional student. They become like a professional yeah go to counseling guy. Look, I want to go there and get in and get out and get back to life. Right. Because mm -hmm. I don't want this to be a forever gift that keeps on giving. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, today what we do is just share what this looks like, but I had somebody, um, send that question into me. I've heard you, Jody, say that you've stopped through the years. Now, yes, it was a 20 year process, but I'd take a year off or something. But mm -hmm. the reason why I thought that was a great segue is, what I think, and then I want to hear from you guys, when I took breaks, there was so much dust that had come out of my soul that, and there's so much, my mind, while I wasn't confused, there was just a lot that I had to incorporate into myself. And mm -hmm. so to me, if we don't stop and take breaks, you can't just keep rolling mm -hmm. and rolling and rolling. 
because you know what I mean? Like you're just going to get bloody after a while. You have got to stop and pause and say, number one, bring compassion to yourself. All of this happened to me and this is real. And I'm so sorry. Nobody was there. And my mind needed to process it. Like our minds mm -hmm. kept us safe and I needed to process it. And then I needed to find how I incorporated that back into Jody because mm -hmm. you have a propensity to want to throw it away. But if I throw it away, then I don't have a whole lot left to me. Right. I have no childhood. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I liked stopping because I didn't know that's what I was doing. But as I look back and I did it through the years, I realized I needed to incorporate that part in me and I needed to grieve it. I needed to honor it. All of those things, you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe run from it, maybe be pissed off. All of those things. So what can you guys talk about? Do you believe in taking breaks? Do you, you know, or did you just go, you know, solid 10 years with no breaks? Talk to me about that. Emily, go ahead and start first. Well, I think I've definitely taken breaks. I started talking all about all of it when I was like 16 or 17 mm, outside nice, the home. I nice. started healing like some real intense healing in college. Um, but it's interesting because I almost feel like God, life, others like present me with the next thing. It's like, okay, this is the next thing that mm -hmm. needs to heal. There's yeah, like yeah. a seeing, there's like a realization um, and a very obvious and need to seek help because I'm breaking down. I can't figure this out. It's completely confusing and debilitating. Um, so you, I've had multiple instances of that kind of thing, which has led me to seek help. And I started counseling in 2010 ish to no 2008 ish I don't know somewhere around there I have to look at my journals but I went through about five years then six years then took a break then 2020 and you know what's interesting is my therapist actually prompted me to take breaks mm, they're like a good therapist <laughs> yeah I've had really two really good therapists they're like you need to just go live your own life for a while that's cool because that's a good I was therapist because I was taking on my parents problems too right oh and right. it's like no 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 you do your life they need to do their work right you can't try to fix them you can't try to figure them out it's probably never going to be figured out so um, then they've prompted me twice now so when I was pregnant with my daughter my therapist said you need to be able to just be a mom and call me if you need me kind of thing that's um, awesome yeah and then this last jan no january before that january 2023 my current therapist said i think you don't need to see me every week i'll be here if you need me but i i think you need to just go fly be free live <laughs> live That's in your healing. awesome mm -hmm. and I was like I was a little shocked right right um, but I think I have called her multiple times since then and I've had yeah. sessions with her mm -hmm. that's and, important yeah that's important yeah. to have two so yeah it's been it. it's been a back and forth fits and starts and again I almost feel like it's given to me like okay you need to do this and I just have a sense about it. That's awesome. Carolyn, what about yeah. for you? You know, when I look back on it during the, the total crisis years, um, mm -hmm. when I started remembering at 36 what had happened, uh, I think I was so overwhelmed and I was so terrified, um, just terrified that I'd lose my family because I felt like mm. I was just losing my mind. Mm. Um, and so I, I did therapy about every two weeks anyway, but I had mm. a, this wonderful, wonderful therapist. And um, I, I felt like I just had issue after issue, you know, like, like you're trying to come up for air, but you're just being swirled around in so many vortexes, you know, um, it felt like it just 
kind of a wave after wave after wave where I just couldn't get air. And that was certainly the, probably the first 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I would take some breaks, but I, I look back on it and I, uh, my therapist was very busy. I felt like if I stopped seeing him, I wouldn't oh, get right, back in on right. his schedule, you know, kind of thing. But I'm really thankful I did as much as I did. And mm -hmm. um, I was paying out of pocket. I don't know if any of you had insurance mm -hmm. helping you. I certainly didn't. Um, so. And that's anyway. a lot. That's a commitment mm -hmm. to your health. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. it's a lot, you know, but I just felt like this was the only way I could keep my family work mm -hmm husband, mm -hmm. all of that together. Mm -hmm. And it did work. I mean, it, it helped me tremendously. So I, you good know. for you. 10 years is a long time. It is. Yeah. And yeah. I think one of the really cool things um, that Emily, you said, and everything Carol said, I'm not trying to put that out, but I just wanted to go back to that one thing you said, and I bet Carol can resonate with this is that when you're trying to get back to a blocked memory, like I always had this reoccurring dream. I always knew mm -hmm. my entire life that me and my dad and Craig had gone to this motel room. Like it never, I just, Oh, you dreamed it. it. No, I knew that. You but knew I did, that it happened. I did know that we went yeah. to a hotel room. I didn't know what happened in there. I assumed that, you know, it was just rape that they just mm -hmm. took me there, but I knew it was bad. And when I would go to hotel rooms as a child, I mean, as a, and as an adult with my own children, mm -hmm. I'd be up pacing all night. So I knew I something was imagine. bad, Yeah. but so my point going back to your, your being will move you into the healing direction. And I believe that God moves us mm -hmm. into that too, because I'm mm -hmm. a, a, I have a super deep faith. So I do believe that when it's time, because, you know, a lot of therapists kind of dig for it. And I always tell people, I, I remember walking out of this one therapist office, Margaret, I saw her for several years and she fired me. She said, Jody, your issues are too big. I need you to go mm -hmm, to the guy yeah. who trained me, which I appreciate that for. But I was walking out and she had this big stack of books. And I said, what are those books for? She said, I have a client who's trying to get back to a memory. I have a feeling that client was me. <laughs> Yeah. But you know what I said to her? That client won't ever get back there until that client's ready. Mm -hmm. And it's that yeah. kind of thing. I think that people go yeah. digging and hunting and diving. Dude, you don't have to dig and hunt and dive. When you have gotten to the place where your mm -hmm. body feels safe and you know that you're safe, it's going to come out. And, you know, and, and it, I think there's this beautiful leading of the Holy Spirit that says, okay, you're ready. Mm -hmm. Like you've gone far enough. We're going to bring this out. I, I, that's how it worked in my life. And that, it did work, but there were times, you know, I did rebel or whatever. I just ran from it. I remember one day my counselor said to me exactly this, Jody, your mother hated you. And I looked at him mm. and I left for a year, an entire oh. year, because he always tried to get me to talk about my mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to go there because she's the only thing I had left. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, can we just keep that yep. in the ground? Let's just keep mm -hmm. that out there in that buried denial ground. We are not, I hear the bones, leave that shit covered. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't wrong, but I left for a year, you guys, because I didn't mm -hmm. have the strength to face that. I walked back in and I looked at him and I said, you know what you said last time? And he said, I do. And I said, were you scared to say that? And he said, it can go two ways. <laughs> It can make a client run, but you know, ultimately he moved me into healing. He was, the, mm -hmm. he was an amazing man. Mm -hmm. I, he's like an angel on earth to me. He changed mm -hmm. my life and literally changed my life. And cause I started seeing him because I wanted to have a relationship, you guys. And I was such a fucking mess. I couldn't have a relationship with a man cause I didn't mm -hmm. trust. They were awful. You know what I mean? Like, and I just didn't mm -hmm. want a relationship with a man. I did, but not really. Do you know what I mean? Like I just yeah. wanted to be alone because I was sick of all the garbage. So I don't know, you know, you have to find a good therapist because there's a lot of bad ones too. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I know that each one of us here on this call has had good ones, but I would really say to people listening, if you think you have a bad therapist, you probably do because you're you hearing do. us say you do, right guys? Mm -hmm. And you know, what's funny, what I see right now is... um I've started going through Kaiser therapy. Mm -hmm. It's free. And they, you know, they're, they've been doing amazing things trying to provide therapy for people. But anyway, but I, because ha I haven't been in therapy for a long time, mm -hmm. but I see this very intellectual 
talking about issues. Um, mm-hmm. They don't uh, want you to cry. They don't want really? you to be. What? Yes, I'm seeing this because oh, I've seen a number of different gosh. people there. And it's very kind of intellectually talking about things like, and um, I'm not That's saying wild. it doesn't have any benefit, but but I recovered because the, with my the main emotion. therapist, I was really dumping the emotion. And yeah, so, but, and I will say, I probably saw seven, eight therapists before I found yes. Paul, uh, yep. the, the man I, I worked so much with. And, and in fact, they had no idea what was wrong with me. This was before I remembered and mm-hmm. they would, you know, they would say all kinds of crazy things, that, you know, you're, you know, what are you crazy? I had one of them say <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and if somebody doesn't want you to have emotions, let me tell you, you need to find another therapist. Yeah, that that, and you know, actually, uh, my counselor that I went to, he is a cognitive behavioral therapist, which they mm-hmm. believe many they believe that relationship is what you know what I mean. Like they bring mm-hmm. you into a therapeutic mm-hmm. relationship. Mm-hmm. I do not believe that those clothy kind of people that just talk about books and how to heal. You you have to mm-hmm. kind of have a relationship, right? People hurt you, and people also help you heal. Don't you guys think? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and somebody you feel really safe with. Yes, a hundred percent. A hundred percent. I yeah. I wanted to um you know there I was reading it's crazy that you just brought that up about emotion because psalms in the bible are probably one of my favorite thing I read I read a psalms every day and king david was a guy that was the, an emotional wreck almost like he would say you know oh woe is me but then he'd say oh everything's wonderful but he gave us this example of prayer, like Psalms are, are a book of prayer, right? And so I'm reading this book right now uh, by John Eldridge, and I just absolutely love him. But he said that I love this part. And Carol, it just made me think of that. And this book just oh. happens to be laying here. And he says, so I decided that if God could handle David's full of range of emotions, he could handle mine. Yeah. Right. And so the, the truth yeah. is, is that we, you know, moving into that, because now I can't even believe that we're at, at, we're getting at time, but we still have some time here. When we talk about, so now we've talked about those, those residual effects with us. We've talked about counseling and Mm -hmm. when to stop and when not to. Now, when you're in the off time, I just turned 60 and you guys, there's still times I want to talk stuff out. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. I had 18 years of sheer misery. (laughs) Like it just, or I have a dream that comes up. In Mm -hmm. fact, we were just evacuated here. A wildfire came through. It was 300 yards from our Uh neighbor's house. We were evacuated for six days. And you guys, we all live with CPTSD. I know we all do. And guess what happened? The third night I was trying to do really good. I was trying to not drink too much. You know, all of those things, Mm self-care, you know, and on the third night I had that old dream come back where I murdered somebody and I got away with it. My uncle was there. It's the same dream I used to have all the time. And you know what I knew? Oh no. I, and so I woke up and talked to my husband about it. Cause I could tell that cause I was in other people's homes. I was out of my home Yeah. because the other thing that people don't really understand is to survive childhood trauma. You, maybe I'm wrong. Now I'm going to speak for myself. I live in a pretty controlled environment. My house is pretty tidy. My world is controlled. I'm, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of ruled. I go to work. I come home. I don't like a lot of people in my house. When I do, my husband needs to talk to me about it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I like dinner parties, but I like it. So when I'm, when I'm taken out of that safety environment and I have Mm -hmm. to travel for work, so I prepare for that because it's not always easy for me. And here all of a sudden I woke up with that dream and you know what I thought, you guys, I'm getting on a boat and I'm going across the lake and I'm crawling up the hill to my house. They let us back that day, but I'll tell you what, I started praying and saying, God, I got to go home. I'm not making it out here. And I know Mm -hmm. he listened to me because they lifted that. Well, they actually didn't, we didn't realize it wasn't for our side, but they let us in and I was so thankful. So, you know, you guys, we need to talk. You know, you You had a raging fire and it's going to trigger so much. Isn't mm-hmm. that, isn't and that survivor. crazy? So with yeah. stopping counseling, I wanted to stop, stop. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to end tonight's podcast with 
to me, I cry out like David does often to God. If I'm confused, I cry out. If I'm sad, mm -hmm. I cry out. If I'm happy, I cry out. Like people hear me on here and I'll use words that most religious people won't because I need a relationship with somebody that I can talk to all the time mm -hmm. in the bathtub when I wake up. I, cause I mm -hmm. need that internal safety and God gives that to me. So I just wonder how you guys feel about that. Cause you know, do you guys feel sometimes like our, you know, we can't always just go to our husbands or our friends and be I like, know. Hey, can we talk about this? But sometimes we husband, want to, yeah. I, know I know. Talk to me about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to first say something. I just had somebody, um, gave me a, a document about this dreams, these nightmares that keep coming back. Mm -hmm. And it was that before you go to sleep, you complete that dream in a positive way. Oh. Um, and mm. so you keep start programming your brain before you go to sleep that, that, you know, how this could have actually happened or how, how, you know, you were not to blame for this. You were not it's not your fault or you, you know, whatever you need to say to yourself. And That's it does kind of help. Right. And I uh, haven't had that a dream like that in years and years and years. And so no. I knew I was in that state, but mm -hmm. I love that Carol, because again, see children believe they're complicit in these acts. Yes. I didn't mm -hmm. murder that lady. Boy, I can tell yeah. every time I have mm -hmm. that dream, you guys, I'm the murderer. Mm -hmm. They're not the murderer. I kill her. And I'm like, why? And I don't know why my uncle's always there. That's a very, it, there's, I know there's a significance to that, but I'll never yeah. know. But and I think that's so sad to think you took that on and it's so yeah. normal, so normal. It is. Well, and that's what yeah. we all do. Right. And it was the mm -hmm. thing that my father apologized about. But anyway, getting back to that, you guys, yes, I, I'm sorry. I think, no, no, no. I love that. I love that you brought mm -hmm. that up, but, but to, you know, to the point of people always tell us we only have so much time to talk about this. And I say poppycock, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're never quite finished. Are we ladies? No, mm -hmm. we're never yeah, you don't finish. <laughs> you never, we never will because the subject is too immense. Right. So Carol, what do you do in those times when you want to talk to somebody? So, um, you know, I, I will journal, um, mm -hmm. like when I'm really upset, I will write everything down mm -hmm. and, you know, I hate this and I hate that person. I'm so mad. This <laughs> I love those kind of journals. Yeah. <laughs> And then I'm, I've said this before, I go in the car and I just <laughs> blast it out. I use all kinds of language and just real, you know, pretend the person is sitting next Good to me girl. or whatever, and really get mm -hmm. it out because I'm a huge believer in that, me that too. this mm -hmm. talking quietly about this stuff does not get it out of your soul. It doesn't. No, well, and it it's doesn't. honestly not even appropriate to no. the crime right like it's so no. true you're, it's you're faking appropriate it appropriate to yep. scream and holler and yes. swear and yes. be completely appalled yes so. yes 100%. and i also um found that the terror was so huge in me and i, I still once in a while will do this i scream i just don't mm. you know i'm a singer too so um I just don't connect my vocal cords and I go in the car and just scream and scream and scream. And it is the most cathartic thing I can mm -hmm. do to get that terror out of me that still mm -hmm. can show its head, mm -hmm. you know, so. It can, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the part, I guess, that I always want to say, and I love these conversations mm -hmm. because it's okay to have conversations about it. We're good, strong, healthy people. Yeah. And we can still talk about it. It is, oh, yes. it is not, you know what I mean? But there is this weird thing like when I'm healed, I won't talk about it anymore. Poppycock, mm -mm. that's mm -mm. not the truth. It's just not the yeah. truth. So Emily, what do you do when you want it? I love that we all have our own thing. And I love yeah. that Carol gets in the car and screams. I have done that <laughs> myself before. To my mother, well, I when to I'm do that. angry, I have to like hit something. And I've been this way since I was a kid, just mm -hmm. hitting my pillow. Yeah. Um, I've done a whole lot of kickboxing. I've done yeah. a whole lot of running. Like there's now as I'm getting older and my body can't handle the mm -hmm. impact anymore. It's like swimming. It's pushing my heart rate on whatever gym equipment I can, but you right. know, not, not excessively, but like for half an no, hour, I just get, get that energy out. Um, and I do a lot of singing in the car. So oh. I have a whole uh, 
playlist that oh, I call I P- PTSD yeah. recovery playlist. <laughs> and it's it. all these songs I brought together that are a mix of worship songs, of songs about personal growth, of songs That's about cool. home, you know, the theme of home. Mm-hmm. And um, I listened to that today, actually, on my oh, way back home that. because music I'm, is huge. Yeah. And I need to sing. Singing is a big thing for me. But I've done a whole lot of praying, mostly outside walking, a lot of crying while I'm praying outside walking, mm-hmm. um, done a lot of journaling. But oh, I thankfully, that. I have an extremely patient husband. And it came up even this last week where I realized something I need to talk about and he was able to listen. So that's really helpful too. But I am sensitive to not wanting to overload him because he's right. got his own right. everything too. So it's true. And right. And we really hope we're at time. We're actually over time, but I just love visiting with you guys. And mm-hmm. thank you so much for being here tonight. And we just hope for you listening that this helps give you that cathartic release that you're looking for as well. And if you have a topic that you would like the three of us to discuss, we would love you to send that in um, to graced XOXO at hotmail.com. I get a lot of emails. I read every single one of them and respond. And if you're out there and you're listening and liking what we're doing, please give us a like or a follow because it's how it works out here even though the analytics are great. And in my heart, that's absolutely fine. So be blessed this week, you guys. I will be in touch with you guys to schedule our next one. Be thinking about what topics we want and God bless your week. And I want extra protection over you guys for stepping out and doing this stuff. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much, Jody. It's wonderful. Love you guys. Okay. See you soon. Love night. you all. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye.